All right, so uh, MR, um, we've sort of talked about some of the anatomy already. We'll look at the pathophysiology. Um, we'll talk about how imaging uh, is important for MR. And uh, I'll just give you a, a one or two lines on the approach. So the prevalence of valvular heart disease, this is, a, this is a paper that gets cited all the time by Nakomo et al., 2006, so 10 years old, still the most current we have. Every decade, the incidence of all valve diseases go up. Uh, mitral uh, is the most prominent, followed by aortic, and by the time you're age 75, about 10% of the population have significant mitral valve dysfunction. So it's a big deal, uh, and it's actually getting a bigger deal as our population ages. So the mitral valve is more than just these leaflets. We've been alluding to all the subvalvular apparatus that's very important. Uh, this, is the, uh, this is the often replicated slide from Catherine Otto in, in New England Journal. But it's a nice one because it shows the basic elements. And all of this is the valve apparatus. So it's really a lot more than just the leaflets. You need all of this working. You need an annulus that contracts in the right way. Of course, you need competent leaflets that aren't thickened and retracted. You need primary, secondary, and tertiary cords to get you a co-optation zone that actually will stop blood flow. You need papillary muscles lined up midline in the middle of the heart uh, with appropriate tension at the right time, and that don't splay out the cords and the leaflets. And you need normal ventricular geometry and function to have the pap muscles do what they're supposed to do. So this is all collectively known as the apparatus. Um, again, the guidelines, the newest version of the guidelines uh, have finally split apart the concepts of degenerative MR with functional MR. Functional MR, as you know, means that the leaflets are intrinsically normal, but the problem is in the subvalvular apparatus. We'll come back to that. Looks like a bishop's miter, hence the name. There it is, bishop's miter with cordi. Um, so this is um, the importance of the co-optation zone. Uh, if you haven't ever gone there, guys, go to the University of Minnesota website. They have all of these uh, animated hearts where they basically take a fresh cadaver heart, they hook it up to flow, put in saline and a bunch of video cameras. And it's a really nice way to see how uh, valve motion works. This is important to show the depth of the co-optation zone. So it really is you know, several millimeters, somewhere between six and 10 millimeters in depth of the co-optation zone. It's not just the leaf that's touching at a point. They really need to overlap uh, in a significant way to be competent. And, so that leads to some of the complexity of the repairs, but also the importance of the subvalvular apparatus. So this is the anatomy test for you guys. Um, where are the papillary muscles located? So you have three options, A, B, and C. Uh, this is looking down on the mitral valve, the aortic valve shown here. This is the anterior leaflet, posterior leaflet. Option A has the pap muscles equally positioned under each uh, leaflet with cords going to respectively either the posterior or the anterior. B is pap muscles kind of out here by the commissures with a few cords to anterior, a few to posterior, but none crossing the midline. Or you have option C, where the pap muscles are really under the anterior leaflet. The vast majority of cords go to the anterior leaflet, and just a couple little cords go to the posterior leaflet. So I'm going to, uh, there's no such thing as anonymity here. Who wants A? A few A's, B, a few B's, and C. Okay, so that's always the same every year. So the answer is B. Um, so the important thing is the pap muscles exist under the commissures, no cords cross the midline, and that's why if you have an ischemic event and you blow a pap muscle, you actually have a huge amount of MR because you've lost all the support for both leaflets on the lateral side. So this is important to recognize when you start thinking about subvalvular apparatus, we're getting into an era of mitral clip. Tough to put a clip over here because you have a jungle of cords easy to put a clip here because you have no cords. So structural interventions really, um, you know, you have to know this anatomy. And if you want to get into TMVR, transcatheter mitral valve replacements, this stuff is all very important. So I encourage you early to get to know your valve anatomy. Okay, this is, if you didn't believe me, this is a cartoon, shows the same thing. Pap muscle, pap muscle, all the cords. So pap, medial pap sends cords to both leaflets. And these are the scallops. Scallops are labeled one, two, three, going from lateral to medial. So it's P1, P2, P3, moving from the outside where the appendage is to the inside where the atrial uh, septum is. Uh, Barlow's disease is this one down here. Basically, there's fibroelastic deficiency 
is sort of one end of the spectrum where you just have a thickened kind of mushy cord. Uh, and then when all of the leaflets become uh, full of uh, glycose aminoglycan and very moist and, and puffy and weak, that's Barlow's. And it's a, really a continuum all the way across. But that's all degenerative mitral disease. So here's a quick patient case. 58-year-old gentleman comes to the ER. Uh, he's hypoxic. Um, he's hypertensive. He's got crackles. Um, he has a, a laterally enlarged position of maximal impulse. Um, he has a uh, normally split S2. He's got a systolic member and a diastolic member and an S3 and a little bit of edema. This is his really old imaging modality that we still sometimes get. Notice there's no section today on x-rays, but occasionally we still get an x-ray. We see uh, pulmonary vascular redistribution. We see an enlarged cardio-pericardial silhouette acknowledging that the heart includes the pericardium uh, in, this, in, a, in, a, in a projection like this. We see splay carina, and it doesn't project as well, but really what you see is, uh, if you looked on a proper monitor, there is a big left atrium and a big left ventricle. So the valve lesion that gives you both a big left atrium and a big left ventricle is mitral regurgitation, because it's a volume load of both. So this is the, what it looks like, big flail posterior leaflet. Huge amount of mitral regurgitation. This is a color display. But the fact that you can see the hole with no color is, you know, you don't need anything else that tells you it's severe MR. So the stages of MR, real important to think about. Um, so this is normal. You have a forward stroke volume of 100 cc's. You have an LA pressure of 10 and an end diastolic volume of 150. And then you pop a cord. Something bad happens. Uh, now you have acute MR. Your LA pressure goes up to 25. You don't feel good. You're, you know, somebody might write this off as a flu or, or an asthma attack or sometimes a pneumonia. We often see that. Forward stroke volume falls because it's going backwards. And the end diastolic volume quickly increases because now you've got that regurgitant flow has to come forward again. So you're double loading the LV. All the flow is supposed to get plus the regurgitant flow. So it's a volume load of the LV and the LA. Often patients will then enter this sort of chronic compensation. The LV will get bigger, the LA will get bigger, so the LA pressure will fall. We'll start to feel better because the L larger LA is allowing the pulmonary vein pressures to fall so they're not as dysmic. Forward stroke volume starts to go back up because the LV got bigger. So you've got adverse remodeling occurring, but they generally start to feel better. And then at some point the wheels fall off and they become this chronic decompensated. And when they get decompensated, the pressure goes up, the for forward volume goes down. And a lot of our interventions are focused on trying to intervene sometime between when they become decompensated. Um, but that's the pathophysiology of MR. And that's really what you follow, and that's what you're doing with all your serial imaging, is you're looking for uh, evidence of LA um, decompensation, LV, uh, size enlargement. Lots of causes. Um, for nowadays, I think we'll, you know, this really should just be broken down to there's primary leaflet pathology, degenerative MR, and it's ventricular pathology. And those are the two main causes of primary and secondary MR. This is that secondary example. LV, systolic function, is impaired. You see the infralateral wall is basically akinetic. And these leaflets aren't co-opting with an overlap zone. There's no zone of co-optation. They just have a point now. So now they've got to hold back all that systolic pressure with barely making contact. And this is what that looks like. So this is a normal orientation. This patient has had an infarct, and when they have an infarct, you have uh, local remodeling. So this myocardial wall with a pap muscle is attached to has an apical and lateral displacement as it remodels. There's no compensatory increase in the cordal length. So now you've taken the primary support and moved it out of the way. You didn't elongate the cords, so now they're, te they're tethered. You see this? See how this anterior leaflet has this little hook in it now? So it used to be flat with a co-optation zone. And now it has this hook. And we see this hook all the time. And here it is. This is an actual patient echo. You see the hook first. You can almost predict, hey, this patient actually has regional dysfunction right here because of the morphology of that valve. And sure enough, you turn the color on, and there's MR. It's an illusion or it's a falsity to think that functional MR has to be central. Absolutely not. Uh, if it's a global LV dilatation, that tends to lead to central MR. But this is a very regional ischemic insult. Someone called this ischemic MR. They're all thrown into the concept of functional MR. This is a 
very eccentric, wall-hugging jet with a primary ideology of ischemic insult. So don't believe the functional MR equals central MR. That's not true. All right, so in terms of the size of the problem, primary MR uh, is this many patients. Functional MR is a, he sort of dwarfs it because of the burden of ischemic disease, hypertensive disease, uh, and the post-infarcts that are surviving years later to get MR. So it's a much bigger problem, the amount of patients with functional MR. Uh, MR grading, this is the guideline now that's, I uh, uh, can't believe it's 2003. Um, this being rewritten right now, it's been rewritten, it'll be out in January, so there's a brand new uh, guideline for the quantitation of ECHO, comes out in, uh, should be January or February of this year for the ASC. Um, the, all these other parameters are on the ECHO, things to recognize, LA size, LV size, uh, qualitative features of the flow, and then importantly, quantitative features of the flow. Let's see here, there we go. Just to show you what they are still today, and these aren't gonna change in the new version of the guidelines. Regurgitant volume, over 60 mils is considered severe MR, but as we mentioned earlier, you wanna index that volume to that particular patient. So the regurgitant fraction is what does that. So regurgitant fraction over 50%. So when half the, the stroked volume goes backwards, that's severe MR. It really does matter. This is a study from Mayo many years ago. They looked at patients who were all asymptomatic, and they said, well, what's, at the day you present with asymptomatic MR, if we quantitated the MR based on an effective regurgitant orifice area and followed you, what happens? So all asymptomatic, if your EROA is greater than 4, which is a point for severe, uh, roughly 60% uh, were alive at 5 years if you had severe MR baseline, all asymptomatic. So it does have some prognostic importance to, to do this quantitation. Um, finally, recognizing that uh, MR is dynamic. It doesn't always last throughout the entire cardiac cycle. So that's one of the challenges in the quantitation. I don't know why this guy's not playing. This guy's not playing. All right. But this is an example down here. If you look at the color, MR flows through all of systole. This is a case of prolapse where MR flows through all of systole. But this is a different case of prolapse, a very late prolapse. Where, and here's the QRS. Well, there's at least two-thirds of the systolic interval is no MR because the MR actually takes time to develop. So if you look at a single color frame, you might see a lot of MR, but it's not present throughout the vast majority of the systolic cycle, so it actually ends up being, if you do a volume quantitation, mild MR, although the single color splash looks big. So it's important to recognize that the timing of the MR and the duration of the lesion matter just as much. Um, that's not typically an issue with other valve lesions, or certainly not the aortic side, but on the mitral valve, it's very easy to have a systolic event. We don't have any leak until late in systole. Um, okay, so generally the approach is first of all thinking about the mechanism, recognizing the timing that not all events occur throughout the entire phase, and then looking at quantitation. So on the anatomy side, you've got fibroelastic deficiency. This is the 3D showing prolapse with a ruptured cord, and then this functional MR that I mentioned. Timing is important, linking about the entire jet. We didn't talk about it today, but when you look at things like PISA to quantitate, recognizing that this event doesn't occur throughout the entire cardiac cycle, it only occurs at one time point, so it's a peak instantaneous measure of, of, of the problem. And then consequences. That's another important evaluation is what's happening to the LV size and what's happening to the patient. How are they dealing with the lesion? Um, 3D imaging, this is an example of functional MR. This is looking up at the LV. So this is looking from the LV up at the mitral valve. This is in systole, and this is the anterior leaflet, posterior leaflet. You get this huge co-optation uh, failure at a time when the aortic valve is opening. So this is, you know, this is the aortic valve is open, mitral valve is open. That's a bad combination. Uh, and when you look at the color, it's a very broad color jet, uh, and the color actually demonstrates very nicely this crescent-shaped flow defect. Uh, so color can be very useful to actually help you with the, uh, the mechanism of the lesion as well as the quantitation. So the approach really when you're looking at MR as a clinician uh, or an imager or both is first question is what's the mechanism and that's often not done. And I'll tell you, we get echo reports all the time to our valve clinic where the, the, the echo report literally says mitral valve structurally normal, severe MR. All the time. Uh, which just tells us that whoever signed that echo wasn't thinking about anything. Um, it's impossible to have severe MR through a structurally normal valve. Something's wrong, uh, and your job is to figure out what that is. 
Uh, next question is what are the consequences of the MR? So LA size, LV size, pulmonary pressures, these are the consequences. And then if severe MR is present, this gets a little more, this is more the icing on the cake. It's how do we give our surgeons as much information as we can so that they can ensure a 90% success rate, which is details on the mechanism, details on regional dysfunction, and then getting into TE stuff.